Um, go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to the Swing Speaker Series. I'm Michelle. Um, I'll be your moderator today. And today we're going to be taking a deeper dive into social emotional learning or what we call SEL. Now, a couple of weeks ago, you'll remember that we had an intro to SEL. And today um, we're going to be doing a deeper dive and um, Glory will be going over how exactly you can use SEL during your everyday lesson plans within the context of substitute teaching. And for those of you who are curious, um, this event will be recorded and um, we will send it out afterward. And before we get started, just a couple notes on the webinar format. This is not a Zoom meeting, which is why you can't see yourself on screen, but you have full access to the chat window. So feel free to use the chat window. And then as we um, go through the event, if questions occur to you, then go ahead and drop them in the Q&A window, which is you can just tap that Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And then when we get to Q&A, we will answer them. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce um, Glory Billiard, who's going to be speaking with us today on integrating SEL practices into the core of the curriculum. And she is a 13-year veteran teacher. She's been working with um, mainly grade school students, but all ages. And Glory began teaching in the Dominican Republic when she was 17 and then came over to the U.S. at 19 on a full ride from NYC where she began teaching in the U.S. And her areas of expertise are um, English language arts and um, ESL or English as a second language, but her deepest interest and passion and the reason we're here today is um, incorporating literature and SEL into everyday practices. And she spent the past five years kind of refining those techniques. So welcome to the Swing Speaker Series, Glory. Thank you so much, Michelle. Glad to be here. So uh, before we get started, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your teaching journey and what brought you to focus on SEL specifically. Well, like you were saying, I started very young. I was 17. Um, I can explain. So in the Dominican Republic, um, at the time, you were allowed to teach even without a uh, certification um, or degree because they would train you at the institution where you would work. And that's how I started. And that's how I fell in love with teaching from the first day that I started. Um, I, I never thought I, I would like teaching, but I fell in love immediately. And that's why I changed degrees. I was studying graphic design and I got my scholarship from NYU. And throughout the years, ever since I've gone through different roles as an educator, I was um, a tutor, a teacher assistant. Um, you know, I've taught English and Spanish as second languages, history, literature, writing. Um, I was an educator for CUNY in the BCC education department. And of course, a teacher for the Department of Education. And to answer your second question, um, I think social emotional learning has always been important to me even before I knew what it was as a concept. Um, it's just always been important for me to treat my students as people first. That's always what I say, people first. And um, establish uh, good and genuine relationships with them. So becoming invested in um, intentionally uh, knowledgeable in social emotional learning, it was just a natural progression because uh, I already knew instinctually how important it was and and how it was a huge part of my successes as an educator. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so it might be helpful for our audience who, we always get a couple people who are like, SEL, I know I need to know about it, but what is it? So maybe you can just kind of reiterate um, how you think of it and what the benefits are to students and teachers. Sure. Um, I could always give you a dictionary definition, but I'd rather not because Google is very accessible. <laughs> um, so I'll explain what it means uh, to me through the lens of my own years of implementing it, if that's okay. Um, so human, human behavior is quite underrated when it comes to its connection to learning. Um, I think so, you know, science and research has already proven time and time again how it's connected. And learning can be like such a vulnerable experience, right? So students become, students can become receptive to it um, only if you have, if you make it a safe space for them to learn, if they feel safe enough to do so. So, and a lot of times you're sharing with your students for so many hours, like sometimes they see you more than they see their parents in the week, yeah. during the week. So you're not, you're not in the role of just pouring information giving out instruction, you're, you're teaching and you're dealing with an entire person. It's not fragments of it, it's an entire person that you're dealing with, that you're responsible for. 
And um, this relationship allows then learning to happen. So, and I also feel that teachers often forget that social emotional learning starts with them. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a good self-awareness of how you deal with emotions and relationships and how you treat people and how you, all of these things, then that's what allows you to guide students to develop those relationships, those good relationships that where they feel safe to learn. And um, then they can carry this model into their other relationships and into who they develop as people. Um, I feel like this is a career um, where there's a lot of technicality, but at the center of it, there's empathy. Mm -hmm. um, you're dealing with people, you have to care about them. So um, I guess the takeaway would be that social emotional learning is that relationship with students that helps them feel safe to be receptive to learning and it serves as a model for personal development for them mm -hmm. um, who, as people who will become, you know, functioning individuals in society. Right. I'm going to go a little bit off script here because there's two things that you said to me that were super interesting. You mentioned safety a couple of times and then you mentioned vulnerability. So um, maybe help me understand, since I haven't been a teacher, what do they what do they need to feel safe from? Well, you know, even as adults, sometimes if we're asked to share things or if we're if we're learning, we always feel that little voice in our head that I don't want to raise my hand and say something stupid. I don't want to look dumb. I don't want to be judged. We all have that. So imagine children. It's like intensified for them. And then if you add so many other things, you know, they have such rich internal lives and context and, you know, like. They're individuals. So like, that's what I mean. They need to feel safe to be vulnerable when it comes to learning. So one thing you mentioned during our earlier conversation is that one of your observations that teachers struggle with this idea of integrating SEL into the everyday and there can be so much focus on academics. There's almost a tendency to view it as like an extracurricular and like, we'll do this after we, you know, check our academic boxes and get that all done. So is there a greater benefit to not treating it as an extra extracurricular and actually integrating it into the everyday? Absolutely. Um, so I treating social emotional learning as a meeting that you do 30 minutes on a Friday, it's it's just not effective. It doesn't work. Um, treating it as an extracurricular versus something that you do every single day and that you reinforce through every single interaction. It, I like analogy. So it's like the difference between being invited to a party and then feeling safe and welcomed enough to dance and have fun and participate in that in that party, right? right Instead now. of just being there. It's it's a big difference. Um, so children are people just like us, like I was saying. So like imagine working at a workplace where admin is very detached and you don't really have a relationship with them. You just go do your job, you leave for the day, that's it. And then once a week for 30 minutes, they expect you to share personal things about yourself and your emotions. And you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna feel safe to do that. You're gonna remain very superficial level. And it's not even gonna help your relationship with those with the admin if it's not something that's reinforced daily through their interactions, if nothing changes about that daily interaction, it's always gonna feel like this weird thing that you have to do and feel uncomfortable for 30 minutes every week. That's um, such a good idea relating it to the adult experience. I had an old coworker who used to refer to it as like mandatory conviviality. And it <laughs> feel, like it did feel fake, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was just about to say, children have like such a great antenna to detect yeah. phoniness. Yeah. And they don't respond well to it. Like, I feel like adults, we deal with it a little better, but children, they don't like that. They, they reject that. Um, and, you know, there is no diagnostic test that can substitute for having a good relationship with students. Um, it just allows you to understand so much context uh, because a diagnostic test can tell you what a student is struggling with, but it won't tell you the why. And the why is extremely powerful. Like we, we often also underestimate students' capacity to be aware of their needs and, and to tell us how we can support them in the best way possible. And, that, and I feel like providing them with the tools to be able to communicate that with us and developing a relationship where they feel safe communicating, communicating that to us 
is what creates like great synergy in a classroom. Um, you know, I, I've often heard coworkers say things like, um, and I've heard, and I'm sure that everyone has heard these things too, uh, sadly, uh, other teachers saying that certain students is a problem child, you know, the problem students. I, I don't like using that. I don't subscribe to it, but you hear it all the time, sadly. And I've often heard them ask me about some troubled child. Um, how do you get Joel to engage in your class and do your homework? He never does anything in my classroom. He doesn't want to do my homework. He doesn't listen to me. What do you do? And um, I, oft, I would often tell them, like, it's no secret. It's so simple. Like, I'm not the most outgoing person. I'm not the wittiest. I'm not the most fun. I just care. I truly care. And I listen to them. I don't look down on any student. I actually, when you're persistent, they, they're going to eventually realize when you do care. And they'll open up to that. And you'll be able to know how, again, how to serve them, how to support them. The best way possible because students want your validation it doesn't matter if it's elementary or high school it's a natural thing for students to want your validation and so they'll respond to whatever your expectation is if you have high expectations low expectations it's all self-fulfilling self-fulfilling prophecy right if you have high expectations of your students they'll believe you oh you think i can do that okay yeah okay you must know what you're talking about i think i can do that and the way that you treat your students and teach your students, all of that is going to be influenced by the what you your expectations, what you think they can actually do. And they will rise to whatever, whatever level that is. So speaking of setting expectations, sometimes I think when you're a substitute teacher, there's an expectation that, well, you know, the full-time teacher has time over the course of the year to run this program or do this or do that, but I'm there for a day. Like, what can I do? So convince me that I I can do this in a day. Like I can make an impact by using social emotional learning, even when I've been like handed this lesson plan. Yeah, um, I've been a substitute too, actually uh -huh. for swing. Um, so I, 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 I'm talking from experience here too. Um, and being a substitute, especially for such short a period of time as just a day, it can be really tough. And there are many challenges, but I feel that integrating social emo emotional learning um minimizes them and it allows you to be equipped to deal with those challenges in an effective way so but it but it's something that i will get into more detail um yeah. during my yeah. presentation yeah so be, i just have one last question before we get to the presentation um you had also mentioned that one of your focus areas is working with um marginalized communities <laughs> excuse me speakers of english as a second language and students of color um what is the particular or is there a particular um benefit to using sel in these communities um, marginalized communities are particularly close to my heart. Um, working with them can have its own set of challenges and it's, it can be a very delicate task and it requires an even, even like an even deeper sense of self-awareness and intentionality. Um, so social emotional learning, it allows educators to approach these effectively um, but most importantly, in a way that protects these communities that are quite vulnerable, historically mistreated, neglected, and they deserve our utmost respect and empathy. And um, but yeah, I will I will definitely dig deeper into the subject in the presentation. Great. Well, um, let's um, get to the presentation. So I'm going to give Glory the floor, and I will um, let you have at it. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Michelle. So um, I prepared the slides very similar to how I prepare slides for when I'm teaching. Um, uh, so we're gonna go over the agenda first. So we're gonna be talking about integrating ES SEL into an existing lesson plan, applications for elementary, middle, and high school, uh, using S uh, SEL with marginalized communities, and finally using it to deal with disruption um in the classroom so oh sorry never mind i thought the slide switched um so the learning target would be i can embed social emotional learning techniques into my teaching practice as a substitute and i wanted to emphasize um that i will be going over social emotional techniques and tips that are 
realistically applicable for substitute teachers, right? Within the limited time and, and resources that you might have. And these are all based on four questions that you all submitted to Swing Education because you wanted to know more about these topics specifically. Um, so let's go to the first slide, the second slide. Um, so we're going to talk about integrating it into an existing lesson plan within the context of a substitute teacher who might just have one day um, in this class. Um, so the first thing to, to understand is that you, you're a stranger walking into these children's spaces. And it is natural to expect pushback and mistrust, right? Like even consider yourself, if you're dealing with someone that's a stranger, you're not going to immediately trust this person or even warm up to them immediately. Um, your goal is to build a positive rapport. You're not building a relationship in a day, but you can build good rapport. And the way that you take these walls down is integrating social emotional learning um, you don't rewrite, you don't rewrite the lesson plan, right? Many times you're not allowed to, you don't have the time, you're just teaching whatever is handed to you. So what you do is you apply social emotional learning to the way that you impart this lesson that's been handed to you. So you need to be interested. Um, it's a, it's a good psychological trick to be interested in people to appear interesting. Right, um, but you're you're not faking it. You're doing the best you can to be interested in the people that you're you'll be teaching for this day. Be curious about them. Be respectful. I think often adults forget that children deserve respect too. Um, so, especially you know, these are children that this is their space. You're walking into it. So be very mindful of being respectful. Um, ask them for help. I feel like it it often makes them feel important, um, you know, and they're, they know more than you. They, they're there every day. They're immersed in it. They know the school culture. So ask them for help. Even if you might know certain things, still ask them. Like it, it just makes them feel involved. And um, you want to be friendly, but stay in your own personality, right? Um, again, children defect, uh, detect phoniness. So just be the best version of your own personality. Ask a lot of questions, smile. All of this will help you, um, will help you both warm up to each other. But be as genuine as possible when you're doing all of this. So um, another thing that really helps is uh, preparing previously. So it's not always possible to get the lesson plan the day before, the night before, but if you can, you can uh, try reaching out and seeing if that's possible it really helps to be ready to know what you're gonna do, not, not just trying to read this and figure it out in the moment. It will help a lot with not feeling stressed and that helps everyone, right? If you're relaxed, your students can sense that. Um, so try to get familiar with the lesson plan. If, it, if you can't do it the, the night before, you know, be there early, go over it. Um, another really important thing is ask admin important questions. So you wanna know, what to do if the protocols, the procedures, um, you wanna know about the school culture. Another important thing is seating charts. Um, students will take the opportunity to sit next to their friends, right? Uh, so a way to avoid this is knowing if there is a seating chart. Um, all of these little things will help. Um, and these are things that are realistic that you can actually do in just a day. It'll help you so much. Um, another thing is being there before students enter the room, if that's possible, greeting them, asking their names, asking about whatever it is as they're walking into the classroom. So all of these things will help you both warm up to each other. Um, let's go to the second slide, please, third slide. All right, so getting into more specifics. Um, so you guys asked, um, how to apply it to different to different age groups, so elementary, middle, and high school. Um, so there are things that apply to some groups, some not so much. So let's start with elementary. With elementary, something that really helps is asking for their routines. Small children really depend on these routines. They thrive on it. 
They have really short attention spans. Um, you know, their self-control is minimal. So like sticking to these routines will allow them to understand that it's just a regular day. It's, it's not as disruptive to them. It's just a different person in the room, but we're doing the same thing we do every day. That really, really helps. So ask for those routines. Um, make sure you know exactly what you're doing, how you're transitioning, all of those things. Um, for middle school, something that really has always helped me is asking someone to step in occasionally. And that could be, ideally, it's someone, an admin, like a principal, a vice principal, that's not always possible, but it could be a counselor. It could even be other teachers. Um, usually when you ask, they're not gonna say no. Well, you know, there's always gonna be someone uh, more than happy to step in once in a while. And it allows students to realize there's someone that knows their main teacher that will hold them accountable, you know? Um, I wouldn't recommend it too much for high school. I'd be careful about it because older kids, they, resent, they might resent that. They might resent being helicoptered around too much. So I would choose maybe if I still were to do that, someone who they, you know, they like or, um, or not have them walk in as much. Um, but I'd be careful with high school. Um, with high school students, um, having students help really helps you because um, especially the students that you see the most talkative or disruptive, channeling that energy into something positive, it really helps. So um, it could be anything from handing papers, helping you with the, with the attendance sheet, whatever it is, have them help you and be engaged in, in that way, in a positive way that's not disruptive. Um, with elementary and middle school, um, a lot of times they'll ask you to uh, be with them in the cafeteria. That's a good, a good moment to engage with them and learn more about them in a way that's more relaxed. Um, you can ask more fun questions. A lot of times they, they don't mind you being around. They actually enjoy it. High school students, um, th there's two reasons why I didn't include it with high school students. Um, sometimes they're allowed to go somewhere else, not the cafeteria for lunch. Um, but when they are teenagers, um, they want that break. They want that break from their teachers. They wanna be around their friends and their girlfriends and their boyfriends. And, you know, unless they invite you to sit with them, I wouldn't impose myself. Um, I'd stay at a distance, allow them their space. Um, plenty of praise also works with elementary and middle school. <clears throat> um, so anything from, um, you know, oh, good job being ready. Um, I love that you helped your uh, classmate with this or whatever. But with high schoolers, it's not that you cannot do positive reinforcement. It's just that sometimes they don't like being talked baby, right? Like talked uh, as children. Um, so I just be careful how I do that with them. Um, and another thing, really important thing for all groups is redirecting in a reaffirming way. So what I mean by that, um, often what I see, and, and I see even older, you know, veteran teachers do this sometimes. Um, if a student, for example, answers a question and it's not exactly the, the answer that you are looking for, they'll say something like, okay, and then move on to the next, um, or say, not quite, um, or say, which is a little closer to, it's a little better, but not quite. Um, they'll say something like, um, good try, but, and that's, that's my thing, don't use but, don't use the word but. So anything you say after the word but is very invalidating. All of those answers are very invalidating, right? So you're trying to build rapport. You only, you only have a day. So all of these little interactions they have a lot of weight. So something I would say is, um, I really like the way you're thinking. And I would like to hear more answers because we're getting close to it. We're getting close to it, something like that. So be mindful of that. And again, like redirecting misbehavior also like in a way that's, um, it's not negative. You want to keep things positive and light. Um, can we please go to the next slide? All right, so marginalized communities. How do you um, implement social emotional learning with these communities? Um, like I was saying before, I 
I'm very protective about this committee in particular. Um, and like you mentioned before, Michelle, I have worked with um, a lot of these communities, um, you know, speakers of English as second language, um, students of color, black students, LGBT students, I've had trans students. Um, so I know that SWING often works with schools that serve uh, marginalized demographics. So I'm really glad that I got to dive into this topic because I know that so many of you interact with these schools. Um, so what are marginalized communities? What can be marginalized communities? Um, some of them are uh, very easy for you to identify, right? It could be by race or ethnicity, um, but some of them are not as easily identifiable as, you know, you could be LGBT, you could be queer and not, it, it not be visible. You could be disabled and it's not necessarily visible. You could be homeless, you could be a refugee. These are not things that are necessarily visible. Um, so just keeping in mind these things, right? The way that you interact and talk about people, even if you don't think they're in the room, it's really important. You don't know the spaces that you're walking into and who's it there. Um, marginalized communities are particularly vulnerable. Like I said before, they've been historically neglected and mistreated and therefore they can be quite hesitant about newcomers. Um, a lot of times these schools, um, these students, they get abandoned. What I mean by that, sometimes they have three teachers, three main teachers in a year. They have a stream of substitute teachers. Um, they're burnt out a lot of times. And this, this affects their self-esteem. This affects their sense of validation. It can do so much damage. It, it, it does a lot of damage and affects students' capacity to feel safe and receptive to learning, right? Um, you might not think so, like it's just school, but they're there for so long. I mean, for, for such a large part of their life, so many hours in a day. And for them to experience this over and over again, sometimes they get attached to a main uh, teacher, even substitute teachers, you know? Um, that's one of the things that would break my heart about substituting. I'd be three weeks, few months in a school, then I leave. And again, they have to experience that loss. Um, so that's the environment that you're walking into. And understanding this will help you with developing the empathy, the patience, the persistence that is required. Um, but something to develop in order to deal with this effectively is a sense of self-awareness. And it's, it can be tough to develop this. It can be a tough process. Um, it can never be so superficial. You have to dive deep. And, you know, I'm someone who's very passionate about intersectionality and intersectionality is just, um, you know, how our different identities intersect and affect the way that we yourselves, the world, and the way we interact with others. So you mind if I jump in to ask you to um, explain that a little bit further for people who aren't familiar with intersectionality? Is that related to something like code switching, or is it different, or is there like an overlap? Well, yes. Yes, there's an overlap. It's related. So with code switching, that would mean that with certain people, uh, for example, if I'm, I'm Afro-Latina, I'm Black, with my friends with people who look like me, I might be feel safe to speak a certain way. And then if I'm in an academic setting, then I would speak differently. Um, so that would be like code switching. And it does have to do with your identity, I guess. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so yes, intersectionality has to do with this. So with self-awareness, like reflecting on what your identities are and how they affect the way that you view the world and interact with the world. So part of this is recognizing two things. Uh, we all have these. We have privileges and we have disadvantages. And some of us might have one of more of the other, but we all have them. Um, so, you know, the, our biases come from these privileges. Um, they're not always malicious. That's something that I feel like it's really important that people understand um, so that there's like, no, not uh, judge, judgment towards yourself. It's not always malicious. It's just how it works, right? Um, it, having certain privileges makes you be in a bubble that is hard to break out of. You know, you develop these blind spots. 
Um, so for example, I can serve as, I can, you know, use myself as an example. I have many disadvantages um, in my identity. So I'm Afro-Latina, I'm Black, I'm queer. I'm, uh, I have ADHD. That's why you see me move my hands and my eyes everywhere. Um, that hel just helps me focus on what I'm thinking. Um, so I have these disadvantages, but I also have certain privileges. For example, I'm able-bodied. That, that makes it hard for me to understand that identity and what it means to live as someone who's, who's not able-bodied. And that means that I can have blind spots. Uh, there may be things that I say and do that are not okay. Um, or for example, just because I'm a person of color, I'm Latina, it doesn't mean that I understand, I understand Dominican culture, but doesn't mean that I understand everything about Mexican culture, Colombian culture, Brazilian culture. Um, so once you have, you do this work of introspection, um, then you inform yourself. And that means, of course, reading, talking with people, being expo exposed to people different than you. But through this process, there needs to be a lot of, uh, you have to remain humble and open-minded. Because just because you read a book about, I don't know, you read a series of books about an issue doesn't mean that you know everything there is to know about it, right? You, you can't go and argue with people who tell you something different than what you learned from a book, right? Who are actually experiencing um, whatever disadvantage it is. So it's, it's important to remain humble, open-minded and non-judgmental towards yourself. Guilt is a self-serving emotion, doesn't really help anyone. So instead of being guilty, be curious um, and learn about people that are different from you directly from them, directly from the source and listen more than you react or talk. Um, Here's a quote that I really like to exemplify what I'm talking about. Um, the difference between the first and second thought. So your first thought is what society has conditioned you to think and the second defines who you are. So we all have biases. That's, that's just how it is, right? So that first thought where you say, well, this person is X, therefore they are X. That's, that can be a stereotype. Then your second thought says, I know that, no, I know that not to be true. That's not okay to think. And then your action is informed by that second thought. That's really what defines who you are. And that's something that, you, that I feel people need to focus on when they go through this process. It's not about feeling guilty. It's about informing yourself, remaining open-minded, remaining curious, and learning to go from that first thought to that second thought. And that defines who you really are. Um, like a classroom, I'm just curious, like how, how do you get to that second thought when there might be a disruptive student or something, someone who's annoying you or like, I'm just making this up, but whatever. Yeah. It is. yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's exactly why this is something that you do every day. You reinforce it. Social emotional learning is about reinforcement. Every little interaction. This is, this is work that takes time, right? There's, there's no deadline. This is an ongoing work, right? If, for example, like I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm able-bodied, that's something that's, that's, if, you know, it doesn't change for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life, I will have to do that work of learning how to, how to deal with that um, bias, because they're there, they are there, those biases are there. So just remaining always in that um, student role, you're always learning, you're always learning, and you're always being humble, and you're always, uh, you know, Eventually, when you get to that moment in that classroom where like you want to be reactive, eventually you learn to do that switch. But it's a process and you will, it will require patience and time. And it's a lifelong process. Can you give us an example, maybe either from your experience or from another teacher's experience where this has come up and um, they've used that sort of introspection and social emotional learning and getting to that second thought to maybe diffuse the situation or solve a problem or whatever it is. And I know I'm going off script, so might be Yeah, hard. no, actually, no, <laughs> I can think of uh, anecdotes on top of my head, no problem. Um, so, okay, yeah. Um, so I had this um, classmate when I was at NYU, we were student teachers, we all went to different schools, but a lot of the schools were in marginalized communities. They were 
um, but most of my classmates were uh, white Americans. I was uh, the one uh, person of color. And um, I remember this one classmate, she, we would share, we had this uh, course where we would share about the student teacher experience. And she was crying, she was distraught. She was saying, you know, I'm, I'm so nice to them and they won't open up to me. They won't warm up to me. They don't trust me. I don't get it. I'm doing everything right. I'm always nice. I do all these things for them. And she was crying, she was distraught. And I could, I could sympathize with it. Her emotions are valid, but you know, I, I told her this, you're making this about yourself because you know they have all the reason in the world, these were black students, all the reason in the world to not immediately feel warm towards you. Um, there's so many reasons, right? Um, why, why, why would they? Why would you feel entitled for them to immediately like you and respond to you the way that you want them to? You can't force them to. And I think if you give yourself the time to genuinely interact with them, genuinely develop that rapport and like listen to them and learn from them and be curious about them, then it will naturally happen. Um, in the moment, I don't think she was very receptive. Um, I think she thought I was being mean, but eventually she realized the value in what I was trying to tell her. Mm -hmm. And she saw a change by the end of that semester they had warmed up to her. That's um, great. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Be curious instead of feeling guilty. And I think another one I've heard is be interested versus trying yeah. to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that works inside and outside the classroom when you're mm -hmm. trying to gen like genuinely trying to get to know someone. Exactly. Exactly. Um, actually, it just, just remind me of another anecdote. I'll briefly uh, summarize it. So um, I was um, teaching in the South Bronx. Uh, it, this was a 100% Dominican students, all ESL. And the, the, there was this music teacher. He was white American as well. And um, he, he, he was teaching Bach, right, the, the classical musician. And he asked students if they knew Bach and he wrote it on the, board, on the blackboard um, B-A-C-H. B-A-C-H in Spanish is re read bach. And so when they saw that, they their association was, do you mean bachata? That's a musical genre in the Dominican Republic. Oh, okay. uh -huh. And this is music, right? This is, this is uh, he teaches music. So that was their association immediately. Do you mean bachata? And he went into the teacher's uh, lounge and he was making fun of these students. He was saying, can you believe they have never even heard about bach? And what is this bachata thing? And you know, everyone was laughing and I was, I was clearly upset. Um, I took Pretty some down. time to, to, you know, not answer in anger, but then I told them, um, this could have been a great learning opportunity. You missed out. I mean, you can still do this, but you missed out because you could have used this, this as a stepping stone. Um, you could have done a whole lesson on what are the differences between bachata as a, as a music genre and it used to be a classical music genre in DR, like mm -hmm. what are the differences between classical music and bachata and between box music specifically and, you know, whatever musician in Romeo Santos, for example. And this could have been a way for them to be interested. Why would they be interested in this classical music? You know, you could have used their context, their previous knowledge mm -hmm. to make them interested. Um, and these are things that we, through social emotional learning, he could have made that connection. Yeah, um, that is a great example. Be curious, what is bachata? Students, you tell me. Yeah, he could yeah, have learned. I mean, he's a, he's a, yeah. Yeah, he's a music teacher. So he he's lacking here if you think about it, right? Not them. <laughs> um, I know Bach was at that age here. <laughs> um, so, okay, uh, we can move on to the last slide if that's okay. Okay, so I know everyone's waiting for this one. <laughs> what do you do with students when they are disruptive? Um, so the first step is to be proactive. You want to, the moment you step 
into the school, you want to ask about protocols, you want to ask about procedures, what to do if. Um, you don't want to be figuring this out in the moment as the problem is happening and you're trying to de-escalate. You don't want to do that. You want to know exactly what to do. Do I call on the phone? Who do I call? What are the numbers? Who do I get? Do I get the counselor? Do I get another teacher? Do I send a student? What, what exactly do I do? You need to know all of these things before they happen. And you want to remain calm and collected. You want to focus on de-escalating. You want to check in with yourself. Check in with yourself. Do I, do I feel heat in my face? Am I breathing properly? Is my heart racing? It, you need to remain calm. Don't, no matter how it escalates with the student, you, you need to remain calm. Um, another really good, uh, good practice is record keeping, no record keeping. Um, I like to always have a list of their names and write notes of everything that happens during that day that is noteworthy. So, but you want to let them know. You want to let students know that you're doing this in a way that reinforces the trust that you're trying to build and that positive rapport. Um, so I always begin with positive notes, right? If I see students walking in and doing everything they need to do, I'll be like, oh, wow, that's amazing. These, this group of students and the ones in the back, I see you guys are ready. You're doing your do now. You have your notebook out, everything ready. I love that. Let me write this down. Your teacher needs to know this. And, um, you know, it just helps establish that, that positive environment that you want. And it gives them a signal that you are you are paying attention to everything that's happening and that their teacher will know. Um, but you're not making it into something scary, something that they need to be scared of. Um, and if they ask you, you can tell them, yeah, like I'm just taking notes because your teacher will want to know everything that happened. Um, and I see so many great things happening right now. I want, I want her to know that. I want to stay, uh, you know, just don't start with anything negative. Um, and it helps not only you with this, with, establishing that environment, but it also helps the teacher when they're, you know, the next day they have to grade and whatever it is, it really helps them. I've had teachers, you know, write to me back and say, I had never had a substitute do this. I love it. I love how detailed your notes were. Like they really helped me, you know, um, grade for that day. Um, and you might even notice things that they haven't noticed, like things that students are struggling with and how they can help that student. Um, it really helps with establishing even a relationship with that school. You know, you want to be called back. Like if you're a swing substitute, like it helps with ratings. It helps with them asking for you specifically back. Um, and finally, schools, um, I wanted to uh, just finish with this. You know, schools know that disruptions can happen, but they will, they will appreciate and remember the way that you actually, that you handle it. It's not about, it, it might happen. You know, it's going to happen, but how do you deal with it? That's what they're going to remember. And that's all for my presentation. Yeah, that was like a master class, and I feel like I learned so much. And I love the way you ended on that last note is disruptions are going to happen. The school knows it's going to happen. It's really how you handle it. And I think in any context, it would be easy to think, oh, my God, was this my fault? Did I not do it that right? But just know it's going to happen. And yeah. Like you say, check in with yourself. Is I love the way you say, is like my face hot? Am I breathing fast? You know, what's going on with me and how can I manage this in a calm way? Thank you. That was that was awesome. Um, we do have one question so far. Sometimes the QA takes a little bit of time to um warm up. De Deborah, I see you raise your hand. Hang on a second. Um, let's get to Mindy. So Mindy would like to know, um, what would you recommend with a bilingual class that you'll have for a month? Um, she sounds like Mindy doesn't have any lesson plans and this class hasn't had a regular teacher for a year. What would you suggest? They don't have lesson plans? It sounds like no, based on the way the question was asked. Um, did she say what age group or? Um, she did not, no. Okay, so there are no lesson plans. It's for a month and they don't have a teacher. Well, it sounds like the teacher has been inconsistent. It may be one of those situations where the substitute is kind of rotating through. Okay, so. I mean, should she go to the administration and ask for lesson plans or? Yeah, she can always ask for help in developing the lesson plans or mm -hmm. asking specifically what do they need that aligns with the curriculum of the core curriculum or, you know, um, that aligns with like the rest of what they're learning. Um, I would. 
ask for that first because that's going to inform whatever you do. I I would definitely diagnostics tests help too, um, to a certain extent. Um, but I would focus on those interactions with the students. It's only a month, but she can definitely develop a good enough relationship that can allow her to see how she can support them the best way possible. Um, with bilingual students, there's a lot of support. I would focus on those supports for, um, you know, learning the language. And that's the most that I would do. Like I would, I would ask an admin about the core curriculum. Um, I would ask if there's anyone that can help me like other teachers who would maybe volunteer to help, even like edit it, look, you know, um, and then focus on that rapport and having students help her diagnostic tests and the supports, the language supports. Thanks, great. Um, we do have a question. Deborah has raised her hand. And since we have a small group, I'm gonna go ahead and um, let Deborah speak. We usually only ask, hi, Deborah. What's your question? Hi. Um, actually, I cheated. I wasn't <laughs> asking a question. I just wanted, as an older woman, a retired teacher, a Black woman, to compliment the young sister. I wanted to tell her how much I appreciated what she said, what she did. I've subbed. I've done long-term, short-term. I've been a full-time teacher. I teach college. I teach howling banshees. It doesn't matter. But I still learned a lot. And I just wanted to tell her how much I appreciated her. Uh, thank you. I'm so honored, Deborah. So honored. You, you, do, you, do, you do us proud. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Deborah. Um, any other questions? I know sometimes it takes a while for you guys to get warmed up. Um, I actually had a question myself um, when you were talking about um, the different age groups, elementary, junior high, high school, and what techniques work for what um, age groups. And you mentioned junior high and having another teacher kind of pop in. Like, what are the mechanics of that? Do you? ask them, do they leave their class and they drop in or like, how does that work? Um, so you would have to do this before entering the classroom, of course. Um, you can ask admin, um, is there anyone that can step in a few times during the lesson just to check that students are behaving, just so that they can see an adult that they see every day walking in and making sure that they're held accountable. Um, and if you ask admin, usually they will point you to someone who can do that. And you can just go and ask, hey, um, I'm substituting. And I would really appreciate if you could walk in. It could be during your break or if you can, you know, you, so they're, they'll definitely point you to someone who can do it and is more than willing to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I bet that teacher who walks in kind of knows what the whole point is. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, any other questions from you guys? I know we're getting close to time, but um, I just wanted to um, ask if anyone else had anything to talk about, ask or share. Um, ah, okay. We have a question. Any recommendations on evaluations and assessments? Recommendations when it comes to social emotional learning? Yeah, it's um, looks like anonymous. Um, Mr. or Ms. Anonymous, you're more than welcome to speak out loud if you want to raise your hand and maybe you can give us a little bit more detail. Uh, yes, on SEL and academic learning. Okay, so with social emotional learning, like I said before, assessment and evaluations, I always take them with a grain of salt because there's only so much that they can tell you. Um, I feel like they're really important. It's not that I'm dismissing them. I would never do that. But, um, you know, for example, with grading, with, I, I usually like projects. I prefer projects. Um, I prefer portfolios as a way of grading 
Um, and it's a way of differentiating writing. I, I, I think that that standardization, it usually just harms more than anything. So I would always take them with a grain of salt. And um, so with, with projects and portfolios, it just allows you to grade in a way that you're, you're still holding them to the same standards. You still want them to master the same skills demonstrate that they can do that, but they won't always be able to demonstrate it in the same way. And I feel like allowing them to show you that they do understand in the way that they can is the best way to evaluate. It's like, in my experience, and it doesn't mean that you are, you know, holding them to a lower standard. So that, that's what I, that, those are my thoughts about, uh, assessments and evaluations. Thank you. So Jennifer wants to know, are there any 10 to 20 minute SEL filler exercises you have used that students enjoy? Um, Jennifer, do you have a particular age group in mind? Um, elementary. What elementary. Oh, elementary. So I've, I've mostly taught middle, high, middle and high school, the older kids. Um, I don't, I have experience with elementary, but not as much. Um, with elementary, I feel like it's, it's sometimes easier to get them to share. Um, they're a little bit more willing to share more deeply. So a specific exercise that you could do with elementary. Hmm. I mean, I think they're never too young to understand things like our differences and how they affect us in the world. So there is there is um, this exercise that allows them to also um, move around and learn at the same time. So it's, it, I don't remember the name of it, but it's basically um, you line them up and um, they're going to you're gonna demarcate a starting line. It's, it's a race and you demar demarcate a starting line, but you ask them questions before, you don't tell them the context of it and you will ask them things such as, um, my family comes from another, uh, from another country that's not America and things like that. And so like, depending on what they answer, you will set them back or allow them to move up. Uh, a few steps. And then by the end of it, they're allowed to go and, and, and race. And, you know, they're all going to start a different starting line, starting lines. And that's going to show them they're going to protest. They're going to be like, that's unfair. Why do they get to start all the way over there? And I'm all the way back here. Um, but by the end of it, then it allows the conversation about how privileges, you know, affect us in society, how some of us have that starting line a little further up, some of us a little further know down. know you're talking about, and just for a point of clarification, so you ask them, you know, my family comes from a country outside the United States, then if that's true for that, those students mm -hmm. for whom that's true step They would step them. back. Yeah, yes. okay, I know that game. That's, yes. an, that's an amazing game. People yeah. end up like teary at the end of it because it goes really deep, but in a yes. substantive way. Yeah, I've done that with um, many age groups. I haven't done it with elementary, but I think they can do it too. Um, we've got a comment here, a uh, comment question on seating charts. Speaking of seating charts and based on what the absentee requested for students, for where students sit, um, if I don't know the students and they can easily say the other's names just to fool you, it's hard to get those students' names so I can report to their teacher and you don't want to ask other students for help as this may make them feel being put on the spot. What do you recommend? Um, that's something that happens all the time too when you're doing this. Um, you have to use your own uh, instincts and know how to ask, when to ask. Just write it down. If you don't remember their name, they were wearing or they, they were wearing this and that, whatever description, and then ask a person later on what they've even forgotten about it. What's the name of the student again? Just casually, what's the name of the student? I just want to call them. I don't remember their name. And then there you go. You have the name, you have your note. So you have to be, 
you know, you have to be in smart about the way you do it sometimes. You can't yeah. be super obvious. And <laughs> but sometimes there are students that will help you with, but but that's why it's good to like try and pay attention when you're going over the list and remember them they're remembering their names. But yeah. Right. Good advice. Okay, I know we're getting really close to time and you are on the East Coast, so it is 8 p.m. for you. And I really appreciate you, appreciate you being here for us. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. This has been wonderful in so many ways. And um, for those of you in the audience, we will have the recording and um, we will be sending the link out via text. And we do have another event coming up on December 1st on classroom management. So I know that's also a hot topic. And thank you so much, Glory. This has just been amazing. I've thank you, it. Michelle, for inviting me. I've I loved sharing all of this. I'm super passionate about it, as you know. So I'm right. I'm more than happy <laughs> to <Okay>. nerd out. <laughs> <laughs> nerd out on SEL. Excellent. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. <laughs>